I start my watch here. Uh, it's important for us to be alert in times like this, not because necessarily something I have to say, but because of the content of what we're discussing here, right? So we all, I know you all know this, and I, I feel what you feel as well. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to fight and, uh, and fight a good fight. Um, we, so we need, we need this. We need, I'm, I'm talking about the gospel of the grace of God. Um, and we need the gospel of the grace of God. We need the grace of God and we need the gospel of the grace of God. We need both of those things. And I, so I want to address um, those things in connection. Primarily, we need Jesus. The grace of God is in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's going to be the thrust of the message today. So let's get on with it. Nothing in the gospel is inconsequential. Uh, nothing in salvation is expendable. Nothing in grace is unnecessary. Everything that we have from God is vital because of the magnitude of the work that he's engaged in and the depravity of man whom he is saving. Right? Because what he's doing is so great and because who we are is, is, is so low, everything is important. Nothing is kind of like thrown in. Everything is vital. So when we're talking about grace, we're talking about God manifesting his glory in his work with men. Right? He's making himself known. Um, and, and men, at best, we, we fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> in redeeming the fallen creation, God must be the worker. So that's, that's, that's what we've got to see when we're talking about the grace of God, something that God provides, something that God himself does. He has to be the primary worker. He cannot rely upon men for any of the provision. Right, From start to finish, he is the Savior, and we are the saved. In order to bring this fallen, corrupt, deceived, blind, dead, you can throw in anything else in there that, that we are described to be, in order to uh, save us, this creation, and to dwell in his presence, the presence of his holiness forever, he's going to need more than simply their efforts, right? He's going to, be, he's going to need more than that. He's going to need to enter in and do the work. Uh, and in order for them uh, to do what he requires, he's going to have to do a work for them, then he's going to have to do a work upon them, and then he's going to have to do a work in them. And all these things are involved in grace. All these things are involved in the gospel of grace. <clears throat> in effect, he is going to have to bear their sin and make propitiation for it. He's going to have to do something for them, right? And then he's going to have to uh, make them a new creation that is fitting for his dwelling in them so that he can get on with the work of doing uh, something in them, right? So he's got to do a work. He's got to do a work for them. He's got to do a work upon them, and then he's got to do a work in them. Grace accomplishes all this, and the gospel of great of the grace of God makes this known. You got you got to know this in order to kind of like apprehend it, in order to lay hold of it, to to believe it, and to enter into these works that are that are greater than you. Greater works shall they do because I go to the Father. Like in order to 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 confidently enter into something like that, you're going to need to know about the power of God at work. Uh, towards you who believe. So in, when we're, that's why we have to talk about the gospel. This has to be made known. It, it's not enough in some sense for grace to be avail, just be available. Right? It has, to be, it has to be made known to us that it's available. Um, what, what good is grace to men who cannot access it because of the ignorance that is in them. Remember that it was even mentioned about Israel being ignorant of God's righteousness. They went about to establish their own. You can almost say that about grace as well. Being ignorant of God's grace, they go about to uh, try to accomplish the salvation by their own works, right? It's the, same, it's the same idea. So it has to be made known. The gospel which we preach must make this known. Right? This, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to emphasize how the gospel is central uh, in, our, in our salvation, in the preaching, in the ministry of the saints. We've got to make this known. We, and, and now everything we've talked about, the hope of the gospel, right, and, and, and the various things that the brethren abroad, the peace that's involved with the gospel, the gospel of peace, the gospel of the grace of God, all these things have to be made known in our preaching of the gospel. <clears throat> if men do not know about the provision of God, they cannot live honestly and confidently at the same time. They don't know that this is available. You can't honestly approach God with confidence if you don't know that any grace is available to you. Grace without the gospel is unobtainable because it is simply a mystery. The word of God's grace is, the word of it, the gospel of it, is actually able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. This word enables men to appropriate the grace that is afforded to them by Christ and do so by faith. So not only is 
grace without the gospel unattainable. A gospel without grace is perilous. Like any, any message that is preached that doesn't involve grace, this is a perilous condition. It'll leave people striving according to the flesh, continually falling short and questioning even the proposition of salvation and certainly doubting their own salvation. Has anyone tasted of that? Like I have experience in this. If you, if you don't hear much about uh, the grace of God, you're not aware of it, you're going to constantly be doubting at best. You're never going to know if you're actually, because you're never going to measure up, right? You're, you're just going to, all you're going to know is that you fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> the gospel is a message of grace, and it desperately needs to be preached as long as it is called a day. You know, it's, it's common for us to say, you know, in our culture, in our day, what's well, this is always true. It's, it's, all, it's always true. It's always appropriate to preach the gospel of the grace of God. For a gospel without grace is no gospel at all. So let's talk about this. The gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. I don't know if there's a limit to what we could say here. You know, there's a, when you start thinking about the grace of God, it's really hard to put parameters on this. But the gospel announces that the Lord has provided all things necessary for eternal life and glory. It proclaims a salvation that is not of the works of men, but is of God works, right? So we have to see this in comparison to law or any law or the works of men. It says to its hearers, what you couldn't do, God did. Furthermore, the gospel of the grace of God declares that men can be joined to the Lord and that in Jesus, that's a key phrase, in Jesus they have divine power to overcome the world as more than a conqueror. Even more, the gospel of the grace speaks of the fullness of salvation in the world to come, in the ages to come, when he shall make known the riches of his grace and kindness towards you in Christ Jesus. So the gospel of the grace of God, it stands in stark contrast to the commandments of the law of Moses, not in opposition, not in discord, not as though one is against the other, but it's just, they're just vastly different. The messages are vastly different. The gospel of the grace of God is good news because of the work of the law of Moses. Right? This, is, this, is what, this is what makes it profound, the gospel of the grace of God. His, his, Moses' effectual ministry and the ministry of the law makes, makes us very much aware of a gospel of grace, of a gospel of the provision of God where we have all uh, been condemned through the law. The law of Moses effectually stopped every mouth and made every man accountable to God. The message of salvation in Christ Jesus is good news because the law condemned every man and the gospel announces that you can have forgiveness. That you, can, that you can overcome, that you can live righteously before God, that you can stand before him faultless and without blame, without spot, and with, and with exceeding joy. Like, that's what the, that's what the grace of God uh, avails to us. Amen. So here's some comparisons. The law demands that men work. Grace demands that men cease from their work. I like to think about that. Law says you must do it. God, uh, grace says God will do it. Law says do. Grace says believe. Law makes sinful men guilty. Grace makes sinful men righteous. That's something to think about. So what, uh, so what is the gospel of the grace of God? <clears throat> I want to suggest three things here. That it's a, it's a message of divine provision. It's a message of divine mercy. And it's a message of divine help. Divine provision. Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So the gospel of grace announces that what was necessary to pay for sin, to satisfy the wrath of God, to vindicate the forgiveness of God, and to justify men has been ac accomplished in the sacrifice of Christ. This is like where we started out, their justification. The grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God announces that. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. But it's also a message of divine mercy. It is, at the, it is at the throne of grace that men obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. <clears throat> this is necessary for the present day. So while we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses, it is also necessary that we have grace now and that we have mercy now. So that when God looks upon our condition as a man, he sees the infirmity of the flesh, he sees the weakness of our own strength, and he's able to have mercy on us, not to condemn us for it, but to get, then give us grace. See, so, so it's, it is a message of, of mercy as well as um, of provision here. So grace is given because God has considered our frail estate and has been merciful to us. When men draw near to the throne of God because they are vulnerable uh, to the temptations in the world, he does not turn them away. <laughs> That's good to know. He does not chastise them for their imperfection. Instead, he sees their humble and their contrite heart. And he says, I can have grace upon someone like that. 
I can provide help to someone like that. In fact, I can give them grace that they can overcome the thing that would have otherwise overcome them. <clears throat> so it's also a message of divine help, mercy and grace to help in a time of need. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace teaches you to live rightly. And so we have the provision in, in the cross of Christ. We have, we have mercy and grace to help in the present day. Um, and, and, and this help actually prepares you for glory. It prepares you for the judgment. It makes it so that you can live here and, 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 and righteously stand before God on the basis of your faith and what he has worked in you. God does not just pardon our infirmity. He helps us. He doesn't just show us mercy. He gives us grace. Paul could rejoice then in his infirmities because he knew that the power of Christ would rest upon him. He knew that grace was up to the task, and you can know it too. So I like thinking about how grace is necessary for justification, for sanctification, and for glorification. It's a good way to think about it. See, there's really, I'm having a difficult time setting any, any boundaries here. I don't know that I need to. Grace is an eternal gift, though. It covers the past, it empowers the present, and secures the future, right? So specifically, your sins are forgiven and taken out of the way. Your infirmity is pardoned and you are supplied power to overcome today. And you will arrive safely in the world to come where God will show you exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards you in Christ Jesus. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the grace of God. I'm telling you, people need to hear about that. In Christ Jesus, men have been given access to this God-favoring environment wherein God can dwell in them and do all his pleasure. The end of grace, where it's taking us, is glory. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we currently stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Right, so this, we, can, we can hope in the glory of God because we're standing in grace. And we know what grace is, why was grace given to us? Well, for glory. So we can rejoice in it. <clears throat> salvation is by grace because salvation is by a savior. If you need Jesus for it, you need grace for it. Jesus is central to the gospel and the grace of God is in him. God has provided salvation to men in Jesus. So when we talk about grace, we must talk about Jesus because Jesus is full of grace. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace, and of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. That is to say, you actually need grace to receive grace. You, you, you need divine help. You need to be made, and this is something that's kind of relatively new to me. Grace makes you fit for more provision of God. So you need grace to receive more grace. God gives you divine help so that he can make do greater works within you. This is an ever increasing situation you see here. And so, so the key is you come before him humbly and contrite and he, he gives to you grace. You draw near to Jesus and Jesus is full of grace and he's able to minister it to you. Jesus is the only begotten and he is full of grace. And when we receive him and we receive of his fullness, we receive grace. He came into his own, his own received him not. But to those who did receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, how about that? Well, how is this? Because he's full of grace. And when you come to the Savior, he saves and he gives you grace. And now you empower to become the sons of God. We are born of God by way of partaking of the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Now compare that to the message of the law, right? It's starkly different where men were never changed into a godly generation by laws and commandments, they are changed, even created in Christ Jesus unto good works by grace through faith. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. See, he's not separated from him and you can't have grace without him. And you can't have grace and walk away from him. <clears throat> we are partakers of grace by, by fellowship, by virtue of being in Christ Jesus. Our being joined to the Lord is what makes us stand in grace. Amen. We must consider the grace of God as a sort of, 
as a sort of environment in which we are made fit vessels for the habitation of God Amen. through the Spirit. In the Revelation, we see Jesus standing in the midst of the churches. This is an environment of grace in which the churches are being cultured as a dwelling of God. All the provision of God is made available to them, and they are increasingly changed into the glory of Christ. Where they fail to live in accord with the grace that has been given to them, the candlestick is removed. What I'm saying is when, when Jesus is in the midst of the churches, they're in a place of grace. They're in a place of divine provision, divine favor. And if they live contrary to the grace that has been given to them, that's when the candlestick is removed. They're living, they're living contrary to what they've been given by God. You see what I'm saying there? So it's more, of like a, it's more of like an environment that they've been placed into in Christ Jesus. Where Christ is, it's an environment of grace. And you're, 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 you have access to divine power, and so you can live in accord with the divine power. But if you live contrary to the divine power, well, that's like, that's like doing despite to the spirit of grace. That's living contrary to the grace that's been given to you in him. <clears throat> those who turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, those who receive the grace of God in vain, those who seek to be justified by law and resort to another gospel, those who frustrate the grace of God and fall from grace, that's like having the candlestick removed in an individual sense, right? So this is living contrary to what you've been given in Christ. They were shown grace, they were placed in this environment of divine blessing and neglected its purpose and abused their position, and it will not go unnoticed. It, it, it just marvels me that, this, that these things are possible, that you can turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, that you can frustrate the grace of God. That is, you don't take advantage of what it's been, what's been provided for you, and you go to something else and try to do it in your own strength. That's it, brethren, it's possible. They'll take heed, right? Yeah. However, I'm convinced of better things concerning you, right? <laughs> concerning things that accompany salvation. You can be like the Apostle Paul. See, so you can see now that grace is like a stewardship, right? You've like, you like been given a stewardship, and, and it's required of a steward to be found faithful. So, so what the Lord gives you, when we're talking about grace, we're talking about what the Lord gives you. What the Lord gives you, you want to be faithful with what the Lord gives you. So some, some were unfaithful, but there are, the Apostle Paul said this, by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not disposed uh, bestowed upon me in vain. It wasn't, it wasn't given to me in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Amen. Yet, not I, but the grace of God in me. See, you can, you can kind of like take that up. You just, that's, he's demonstrating what you ought to do with the grace of God. D don't, don't receive it in vain, but labor abundantly. Work in accord with, with where it's drawing you, which is in, which in conformity into the image of Christ. And, and bringing you to glory. And so as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So this, 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 uh, the gospel now is a summons, right? The gospel is a, is a calling, right? We're called, he's called us by the gospel, right? We are called by the gospel to the obtaining of the glory of God. In the gospel, the spirit and the bride say, come. Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying, come unto me. Uh, for it's in this fellowship with Christ that we are made partakers of grace. That's how. So it's a calling unto the Lord. Uh, and by way of contrast, remember when the law was given, uh, men, were, men stood back from the mountain. But when, but when the gospel of grace is preached, men draw near to the throne of grace. And they must in order to obtain it from Jesus. Grace is not something that you are given by God and then are able to use with your own ability. That would be more like uh, in tune with the Galatian way of life. It's power and strength, but it's facilitated to you by Jesus. And no one can receive the grace of God from Jesus and then leave him to use it. So you cannot have this divine power towards you and then, and then try to use it within your own strength. I'm, I've, I've been tempted to do this at times, but this, that's not actually how it's done. Life is not lived that way. You live in fellowship with Christ, and then he empowers you to live and to walk circumspectly as you're with him. That's grace being given to you. Not that here, here's your grace, now go ahead and live. It's I'm going to come with you and give you grace as we go. <clears throat> so grace is not simply a commodity. Frequently in the scriptures we read of the grace of God being upon a person, right? It's upon them. Uh, we also read that men are standing in grace and that the grace of God is in men and working in them. And things are being done by grace, right? So things uh, that are done unto God are done by grace. So grace is not something 
uh, that is used here and there, uh, bestowed here and there. Grace is more like an atmosphere or an environment that causes everything in its sphere to move Godward. It's just, just, just bringing everything up, giving, giving divine power to accomplish God's eternal purpose in Christ. Uh, this environment of grace surrounds Jesus, and wherever he goes, it goes with him. There, there, where, where he is, there's grace. Um, thou, therefore, my son, I like this. I like to think about it this way, thinking about being in this environment. There, thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace which is in Christ. Just while you're in there, be strong. Right? You're, in, you're in grace, be strong in it. Don't just be strong in grace, but while you're in grace, be strong. So if anyone's here standing in grace, be strong. There's no, real, there's no real reason for you to be weak. If you're weak, it's, in, it's, it's after the flesh, right? It's after your own abilities, and so you draw near and you're strengthened. That weakness is, is where God's power is perfected. That's grace, right? right? So that's what we're talking about here. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and grow in there. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been placed in Jesus. You're standing in grace. Be strong and grow. So let's talk about this. This is a... One other thing I want to bring up here. I, I really like this text. <clears throat> None of these things move me. That's what Paul said. None of these things move me. He was told about things that would accompany his travels, but he said, None of them move me. Then I may finish my course with joy, the ministry that the Lord Jesus has given me to testify, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So I want to talk about this, this word, testify. The grace of God is potent. Paul spent time in Asia ministering to the brethren with all humility of mind, with many tears, and with many temptations. None of these things moved him. Everywhere he went, the Jews were lying in wait to do him harm, but that didn't move him. Though in all of this, he kept nothing back that was profitable to the church. That's what he said. He taught publicly and from house to house. He testified both to Jews and Greeks to repent and believe on Jesus. He was bound by the Holy Spirit to continue to do this, even unto Jerusalem, where he did not know what would happen, only that he knew that bounds and afflictions awaited him in every city. And how much more Jerusalem? But now, of these, none of these things, none of these things moved him. None of them drew him away from his purpose. He didn't like hit a roadblock and just, that was it. He, not, it didn't move him because he was living and walking by grace. That's what grace is capable of doing in someone. Grace is capable of doing that for you. To be, not be easily moved away from the hope of the gospel. To be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Grace is up to the task. Uh, draw near and ask for, a, for an increased supply, why don't you? Right? And like step up and, and we'll be able to do these things. Be strong and grow in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And so what you have from Paul, he was testifying to the gospel of the grace. In other words, he was going around, he was preaching the very message of what the grace of God is able to do. But as he lived, it was demonstrating what the grace of God was able to do. That's testimony. That's what he was testifying to the gospel of the grace of God, whether he was speaking, writing, or not saying a word. Because the way that he lived was a testimony of the grace of God. And so his works adorned the doctrine that he preached. Paul's actions adorned his doctrine. He not only spoke of the grace of God, he demonstrated it by his work and by his life. When Paul preached, it was from an experiential viewpoint. When he talked about the grace of God, he could testify of it because he was a partaker of it first. He testified of the grace of God because he was a partaker. And you must first be partaker and then a distributor. Right? You want to partake of it first. Amen. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. He must be first to partake. This is what the ministry of testimony is all about. I, I, I've said this um, to some of you already this week, but I really benefit from the testimonies. I, I thoroughly enjoy them. I cry all the time. Every time I hear it. Because, because it's a testimony of the grace of God. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's a testimony of, of how the grace of God is not in, in, in word only, but in power. That, that, what, that what I'm talking about here now is evidential in your lives. And I can hear about it. And I rejoice in it. It's a testimony of the grace of God. Paul testified. He was, he was, a, he was a testimony. And what he, so he didn't just preach, this is my doctrine. We're not just talking about theology here. 
right? We're not just talking about this. This is our philosophy. This is what we think about grace. Here, here's what I think about grace, and let me share it with you. It's a testimony. In other words, you, you hear the word of it, but then your experience in the, in the world, your experience in life is, is a confirmation that what the, what the scripture says is true, right? And then, and then when we share that with one another, it's a benefit to us because we can see it in you as well. That's what testimony is about. Paul testified the gospel, the grace of God. He could tell men of God's grace because he was a partaker of God's grace. He, as the chief of sinner, was shown mercy as a pattern for those who would be saved by believing on Jesus, he said. He obtained mercy from the throne of grace, right? He, by the grace of God, was given his ministry to the Gentiles to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. He said that this grace was given to me to preach. And so there's another testimony of the grace of God. And he labored more abundantly than the other apostles. Yet it wasn't him, but it was the grace of God within him, right? So his, his life, and he, he was making this evidential, his life was a testimony of the grace of God. He was a partaker of grace, so his ministry enhanced, uh, his ministry enhanced from the doctrine, uh, from doctrine to testimony. You want, you want to be able to, your, your, your ministry to go from just doctrine to testimony. Let me tell you of one who told me all about my life. Remember the woman? <laughs> but, but, and then it went from, from the doctrine to the testimony. Oh, we found out for ourselves. It's got to go there. So what about you? <clears throat> Have you partaken of what you're preaching? Right? We got to evaluate this. Uh, you who preach peace, do you have peace? You who preach hope, do you have hope? You who preach Christ, are you with him? Is what you are preaching simply philosophy or is it testimony? Right? Is it doctrine? We've got to evaluate this. I'm not, I'm not judging anybody here. I'm, I'm, I'm causing you to evaluate. We've we got we to evaluate here. Can you bear witness to the effectiveness of the truth that you speak? And it will minister to you as, as it does, as you partake of it. It'll make your preaching more effective and more powerful. But if not, well, I, I suggest that you taste and see that the Lord is, in fact, good. He is gracious. Taste and see. First partake of the crop and then distribute it. It'll change the way you preach, and it'll give you more joy when you're preaching it. Lastly, when we're, we're taking this gospel of the grace of God to others, when you're ministering it to others, this is a need of our day. It's a need of any day. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See to it that no one fails of the grace of God. See to it that no one falls because of the weakness of their own strength and let them know about the grace of God that's able to empower them to live righteously, to live soberly in, in this present world and to look for Jesus. You can actually do this, but we gotta see to it that no one comes short of that. If you see a brother or sister like, like falling or stumbling, instead of pointing it out, let's help them. Let's offer them some grace. Let's, let's preach a ministry of grace. In fact, your words can actually minister grace to those who hear. Men must hear about the help that's available to them. And men, men fall because they're weak. Well, we don't just want to point out the problem. We want to point out to the one who can give grace to them. Tell them that God is able to make all grace abound toward you and that you always having all sufficiency in all in all things may abound unto every good work like what's the limit of that yea all you be subject one to another be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble I leave you with those words <clears throat>